Well, the Remples are longtime friends of CBC. Uh, we've been supporting them for, I think, 20 years, we said, as missionaries. And uh, I've been here for 17 or 18 of those years. And uh, so I've known them for quite a while as well. Um, it's always, we're always blessed to have Barry come and share with us. And so he's been going through a series of three messages on Jonah. This morning will be the third. And uh, hopefully there are recordings, I think, of the previous ones. So if you want to catch up on those, I think we can talk to Hank and get that straightened out. Or, or you can go to the YouTube account that we have, and you can listen to those on YouTube at CBC Detroit. So Barry, please come and give us the conclusion to the messages on Jonah. Thank you so much, Pastor Bruce. Good morning to everyone. I was uh, watching the news the other night, and the weather report, weather forecast came on, and they said for Sunday, they literally just put the word yuck. <laughs> and I was like, ah, you know, come on, let's don't, let's don't exaggerate. But uh, when I looked out this morning, I was like, no, they were right. They were right. They were absolutely right. So here we are, and uh, uh, someone said to me, well, you know, you're from Alaska, uh, and you should be able to, you know, you should be used to that. I was like, yeah, but, you know, I have this snow allergy, and it just, uh, yeah. So, anyway, we can talk about that later. Uh, I do want to say something uh, and highlight something that's in the bulletin. You know, when I go to a conference or a training time, and you've done that at your work and, and church and, and uh, different things, one of my biggest questions is, okay, now what? I, I, I buy in. I'm, I, you know what? I, I understand what you're trying to teach me or train me to do. What do I do now? Um, and well, so here, if you're looking for a good next step, you just have to open your bulletin and you'll see on the inside of the first page, it talks about the Kairos course that you're going to be offering here in the month of June. And maybe you have heard about that or you don't know about that yet. Uh, but I want to highly, capital H, highly recommend that to you, and uh, I, I would love it if uh, the registration was full after today, because everyone's going to talk to whoever's responsible and sign up today. Um, it's a great course. Ruth and I have done the course, and even after being involved in missions many years, and, uh, and man, it just it stirs your faith, and it will help you take that next step. So uh, that's my... Uh, two cents, and that was an unsolicited recommendation for the announcement. So there you go. Um, as Pastor Bruce said, we have been looking at uh, Jonah, and our theme for the weekend is has, has been to be a rock in a hard place, to be a rock in a hard place. And if you recall, Friday night, we start talking about, and you know, oh, so what? We all have to become American Ninja Warriors or something and, and be this super tough person. And, and actually, no, we, we looked at Jonah, who's kind of the opposite example, uh, someone who really, you know, he came home from school with a not a good report card. Uh, he was that guy. Um, but he's been giving us some good uh, 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 lessons, if you will, some uh, illustrations of what to do or not to do. Um, and so we started out looking at the messenger Jonah and us as God's messengers and uh, holding that mirror up to our life to see, wow, you know, where is my heart at? Where is my attitude at? And uh, and then we looked at uh, Jonah's audience. If you remember last night, we talked uh, some about the sailors that Jonah meets along the way and and where they were at and how God was at work in them and how God uses us to be working in the audience that we're reaching out to. And then, uh, so today we're going to be taking a look at the message. What is it? If we're messengers, what is our message? And so I want to spend a little time with that. But before we jump in on that, let's just bow our heads in prayer and uh, trust that God will guide our uh, time together. Lord, we do want to look into your word and do so with an open heart and with a mind that is ready. And so, Lord, I just trust that we would be those kind of people, that your spirit would speak to us, Lord, that you would be uh, guiding our thoughts, our, our, uh, 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 the, our reactions and our actions to your word. Lord, may that uh, um, uh, 
uh, spur us on to be following more closely after you. And so we trust you for that this morning. And we pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, you would think with all the technology available to us, our communication between one another would be better than ever, right? We had a great seminar yesterday talking about using multimedia to uh, communicate uh, with one another. And I'm going to say two words that will totally dispel the notion that we are more clearly communicating. Autocorrect. Autocorrect. Am I right? You don't have to raise your hand, but are you guilty of one who has sent a message that totally did not say what you wanted it to say? Thanks to autocorrect. Uh, you know, there's, there's some classic ones and I was, I was looking at some, you know, and it's, uh, happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday, dead husband. Um, uh, oh, I, you know, no, I meant dear. And I mean, and this is a missions conference. And so I, I saw this one and it said the, the person who obviously had had a sore back or something said, oh, I took a Muslim relaxer last night, so I'm good. And the person responds, well, I love that. You know, maybe that would help with foreign relations or something, right? Uh, and, and I realize here we have people who obviously are bi or tri or multilingual. Um, but we probably have some people have, has anybody learned a second language as an adult? Not, not growing up with a second language, but as an adult? Oh, just, just a couple, just a couple. Well, man, you talk about lack of clear clear communication. I have a couple examples here. These are going to look simple. These are in Spanish. Caballo, caballero, right? I mean, it's almost the same thing. Well, that's, if you ask the wrong one, you could say, where's the horse's bathroom, right? I'm looking for the gentleman's bathroom, but instead you said horse. Uh, the second one, abeja, oveja, Right? I mean, I think it's just one, one letter that's different, and if uh, Pastor Bruce or I or someone else was speaking on that, we would be preaching on all we like bees have gone astray. Right? We are the bees of God's pasture, bees and sheep. Right? And then the third one you see there, that one looks just like a, I mean, it's hardly, yeah, cuarto and cuatro. I mean, it's just uh, very similar, but one means a quarter, the other one means four. So this is a true one, and I think my wife, well, I hope my wife's okay if I share this, but she went to the chicken store one time and um, early on and wanted to ask for a quarter kilo of chicken. Just the two of us, right? We just need a little bit of chicken, so cuarto right, of a kilo, but instead said cuatro, uh, and ended up with four kilos of chicken, and so I came home, I mean, we had chicken everywhere, it was spread out, and, uh, you know, so, um, yeah, and then there's the classic one, right, where the pastor calls a lady up to the front to uh, to read some scripture, and, and, and if you've ever looked at Spanish, you know there's a lot of words. You can kind of fake it, right? You can kind of, you just sort of, and so she was feeling very uh, embarrassed, and so she used the word, which is a Spanish word, uh, em, um, embarazada, embarazada, I'm very embarrassed is what she was trying to say. Well, what she said was, I'm pregnant. And people are kind of like, okay. And then she looked at the pastor and said, and it's your fault, right? <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, that kind of shut things down for a while. So clear communication. And, and, and if you go, and if those who, and I, and I hope there are some that are ready to launch into missions, I don't want you to be afraid about that. Someone said to me, learning Spanish and other languages would be the same. They said, you know what? To speak Spanish well, you've got to make about a million mistakes. So you might as well start today. Um, but yeah, you will have your moments. You will have your moments. Um, well, as we think about that process of the sender sending a message and then the receiver, we've been looking at that. Obviously, the clarity of our message, right, is is a very critical. I mean, there's no amount of zeal. There's no amount of dedication that's going to make up for a miscommunicated message, right? With the wrong message, I don't care how sincere you are. If you wanted a quarter kilo, you will end up with four kilos of chicken. It's just going to happen if you're not clear uh, in what you say. Well, how much greater 
importance is that when we're talking about spiritual realities, right? I mean, there's an old hymn. Some of you might know it. It'll kind of tell your age, maybe. Uh, it starts like this. We have a story to tell to the nations. You know that one? That will turn their hearts to the right. Well, what is that story? Well, what's, what's the message that we have for the nations? Well, in a variety of ways in this conference, we've been talking about taking God's message to the nations. And it might be, you know, if we ask, well, do we know the message? We would say, oh, well, yeah, I mean, my goodness, I've been in church a long time. I know the message. And, and, and well, do we? Do we? Do our words and our life give clarity to God's message to the nations? Or could it be that's where the communication breakdown occurs? Well, as we mentioned, we're going to take one more look at our friend Jonah. He's had quite a time of it and, uh, and his message. But to get started, I just want to quickly go back. Some of you were not here so that we understand the role of the prophet. We tend to think that prophets were always telling the future, right? They were kind of like fortune tellers, future tellers, ones who receive visions or illuminations, right? And at times, sometimes you see movies and they'll talk about the oracle or something like that uh, with one of the characters. Well, well, there's some truth to that, but really to be more accurate, we could describe a biblical prophet as God's messenger, God's messenger. The king, if you, if you remember, acts as God's ruler, God's political leader of the people. The priest is the spiritual mediator between the people and God. And here is the prophet, the one who is bringing God's message and his very heavy responsibility. A couple of uh, examples, you can just jot these down. Ezekiel uh, talks about being the watchman. Ezekiel chapter 3.17 says this, Son of man, God speaking to the prophet, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel, so hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. Be careful, Ezekiel. Jeremiah says this in chapter 20 and verse 9, But if I say I will not mention God's word or speak any more his name, you know, I'm kind of tired of, of, of being that guy. His word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones, and I'm weary of holding it in. I cannot hold it in. Later on, Paul uh, we mentioned this passage in 2 Corinthians. Paul talks about this precious treasure, God's message, and he says this for in uh, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 5, what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. That's our message. Well, now let's come back to Jonah, a prophet given a somewhat strange, if not dangerous mission, right? But asked to take a fairly straightforward message. The Lord gave this message to Jonah. This is Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked the people are. We've already discussed that, right? How, How evil they were. They were a people known for their cruelty. That was it. That was their hallmark. You want to know what we're about? As uh, Assyrians, we are about slaughter and cruelty and and conquering nations. And they were they were they were some of the most hated people on earth. We've also looked at Jonah's reaction. God gave him that instruction, and he said, "Ah, uh, no." and took off in the opposite way, and his anger at God, and we've talked about that, how he missed God's perspective, missed God's perspective. But as we consider God's mission in the world today and our role in that, I would like us to walk through Jonah's message. It's far more than meets the eye. I honestly think that uh, in our world, uh, we have a lot of distractions from our message, distractions. It's like... um, you know, when we've now moved back to the United States, so I, I had to, well, I didn't have to, but I did get some uh, cable service at the house. And uh, then after installing the cable and the internet and all that, it seemed to be working. We had a few issues. All of a sudden, the cable company and said there was bad, a bad signal in our line. There was noise, was the word they used, noise in the line. And the signal wasn't getting through clearly. And I thought, you know, that is what strikes me as I have moved back to the U.S. It just seems like there's a lot of noise, a lot of distraction that cuts down on this story we have to tell to the nations. And um, given all the obstacles that are already there, we talked about learning a new language, we talked about maybe learning a new culture and 
different worldviews, like we talked about last night, it's absolutely critical that our message be crystal clear. Crystal clear. This isn't just a funny autocorrect text, right? Eternity is at stake. Well, let me say this this morning, that God's wrath and his grace are equal parts of the message, equal parts of the same message. And our life and our message must demonstrate both of those. So I'd like us to look at three truths, if you will, three lessons that we see demonstrated in Jonah's message that are going to guide us as we seek to be God's messengers, as we seek to tell God's story to the nations. Here's the first one. God's wrath and judgment are real. God's wrath and judgment are real. Maybe that statement sounds a little bit odd uh, or might just make us uncomfortable. One one possible reaction, and I have heard this before, is kind of a zealous, you better believe it, right? God's going to judge all you sinners, right? Right. And don't kid yourselves, there are plenty of... uh, Examples in Bible times through our modern day of people almost finding almost finding a joy, a satisfaction. You know, judgment is coming and you, it won't happen to me, but you will be judged. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But I think at the other end of the spectrum and maybe much more common today who are those who would react maybe even in shock or horror at the talk of wrath or judgment. How can you say that? How can you be so mean, intolerant, right? I can't conceive of a loving God who would want to punish anybody. Uh, besides, who, who are you to be so judgmental, right? We wouldn't want to be known as that guy to our friends, our, our school classmates, our neighbors, would we? Well, let me illustrate it this way. You see there on the screen, you have a photo from an FAA weather cam up in Alaska. Some of you know that I was a pilot up there, and that's a picture of the entrance to Lake Clark Pass. Lake Clark Pass is one of the passes I would fly through going to western Alaska. It's uh, through the Alaska Range of Mountains. Denali, the tallest peak in North America, is part of that peak, I mean part of the Range of Mountains. And this is a, this is a photo, and you can see... Uh, I think I've got a laser pointer here, do I? Oh, yeah. You know, so here you can see it gives you range. So from the camera, that ridge, I don't know if you can read it back there, 1.5 miles. This peak way over here is 7 miles. That one even more distant. That's that's 12 miles away. Here's another 7 miles. So great clear day. And uh, what's not to like? Gorgeous scenery, right? Well, what they show you, this is, this is what it would look like on a clear day, but you could log on right now. Please don't do it. You'll get distracted, but you could, to the FAA weather cams, and this is what you see. This is real time. Well, this was, I think I did this on the 8th of April, so a few days ago, but it was a day like this. So now you're going, oh, my goodness. Okay, uh, can we see one? Can we see this 1.5? Mm, doubtful we got seven no we don't got seven forget 12 miles you have no idea well here's my point in all this um let's suppose someone knew about this situation but they didn't tell me as a pilot in fact i'm there and they said oh mr rempel would you like me to fill your plane with fuel great do you do you need any sandwiches for the flight we can get you some food you know and they're just being so kind and they're being so loving and are they helping me at all no No, because folks, those mountains, those rocks there, those are real. Those are real. If you fly your airplane into one of those mountains, you will die. You will die. And it does not help me to not tell me about these mountains, to not tell me about these obstacles, to not tell me to be careful. Watch out in this path that you want to take through these mountains. Well, Jonah was given a clear message to deliver to Nineveh. God said, announce my judgment against it. And once he had made his detour through the belly of the fish and he actually went to Nineveh, this is the message that he said. Turn in your Bibles if you're not there already. Jonah chapter 3, that's where we're going to be spending most of our time. uh, Chapter 3, starting at verse 4, 
says this, on the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds. This must have been a sight, right? I mean, just shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now and Nineveh will be destroyed. The stark clarity of that message jolted this evil place to the core, and everyone from the lowest servant to the king himself responded. Let's keep on reading. Verse 5, the people of Nineveh believed God's message, and from the greatest to the least, they decided to go without food and wear sackcloth to show their sorrow. When the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne took off his royal robes, he dressed himself in sackcloth, sat on a heap of ashes, and the king and his nobles sent this decree throughout the city, no one, not even animals, may eat or drink anything at all. Everyone is required to wear sackcloth and pray earnestly to God. Everyone must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence. The reality of wrath and judgment was not lost on Jonah, Or his audience. Friends, I want us to be very clear on this. We serve a holy God and a just God who calls all people everywhere to his standard of holiness. You can jot down 1 Peter 1 and verse 16. The Apostle Paul, I'm going to read a few passages from Romans, um, leaves us no doubt as he describes the downward spiral of mankind. I'm going to start reading in Romans chapter 1, verse 21 says this, yes, they knew God as people, godless people, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And then Paul kind of turns it around because you could hear his audience going, yeah, they're bad. Ooh, bad. Yeah, they, they, whoever they are, they are bad. And he turns it around, uh, pick it up in Romans chapter 2. You may think you can condemn such people, but you're just as bad. And you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself for you who judge others do these very same things. And we know that God and his justice will punish anyone who does such things. And then the verse that we probably all learned in Sunday school in 323, everyone, all of us, all the people who think they're good or maybe those that don't, you know, whatever it is, all have sinned, fall short of God's glory. Chapter 6 and verse 23, another verse you probably memorized. For the wages of sin is death. The free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Hear me on this. As we consider this task, all important task of taking God's message to the nations, a lack of clarity on this point is cutting the nerve of the church today. Well, I know we have some medical people. You would know more about this than I do. But you just think of our bodies and just think if in your leg or your arm somehow the nerve was cut, how useless. The muscles are still there. The flesh is still there. Skin is still there. But now it's not responding. It's not able to move. Um, after all, if as we said yesterday, if God's wrath and judgment are not real, what's the point? Honestly, what's the point? Why go through all the time and expense and sacrifice? Why worry at all? Paul himself gives us the answer further along in Romans. I'm going to start reading in chapter 10, verse uh, 13. It says this, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? How can they believe if they've never heard about him? If you were here last night, we had a scroll of paper rolled out, and the gym was not big enough for the paper if you can believe that, listing all the people groups in the world that have not heard the name of Christ. And and we spent time praying for them last night. And uh, how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. Let this truth grip your hearts, friends. Let it motivate your, your actions. Declaring the reality of God's wrath and judgment. It's not about arrogance. It's not about being smug. It doesn't come from a superior, hey, I'm in, you're out of the club attitude. It's a warning of the reality. It's a warning of reality. Don't ever lose sight of that. And let me just pause again right here. You know, in missions, we often, in conferences, we're talking about out there and out there and and taking the message. But I want to talk about in here And if there is someone here today 
that you're going, you know what, that reality of, 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 of God's love hasn't entered my heart. I've been sitting in church for who knows how long. My family makes me come or I come because, you know, for whatever reason. If, if you are sitting here today and you know Christ is not in your heart, please don't go on another day. Please don't, please don't sit here and go through the motions. Let that reality become a part of your life by turning your life over to Christ. Talk to someone, Pastor Bruce, myself, someone. Um, as we read in Romans, it is good news. It is good news. Is it true for all of us today? Well, so the first truth in Jonah's message is that God's wrath, his judgment are real. Let's go to the second truth that we learn. And it's this, God's grace is truly amazing. We sang the song, and uh, Patrick and I didn't even talk about songs for today, and I was so pleased, and I'm going to mention something further having to do with the, the song. Um, but God's grace is truly amazing. Although Jonah's message to Nineveh sounds pretty harsh, there really was an element of hope and grace embedded in, in there. Well, how can we tell? Here's several ways. Well, look at the reaction of the people. We already read the passage, the king uh, says that he declared a period of mourning and repentance, fasting, dressed in sackcloth, which was a sign of sorrow and uh, humility. We see that in verse 5. The king himself stepped down from his throne, took off his robes, dressed himself in uh, sackcloth and ashes. Verse 6 of chapter 3. Uh, just a pause here. Can you imagine any of our political leaders doing that today? Humbling themselves in that way, we are on like the so total opposite path of posturing and, and uh, pride, and uh, that's a whole other uh, message. But all that to say, people responded this way in hope that there would be grace. And as we see, Jonah didn't, didn't share that hope or even mention it, but his audience held out hope. Perhaps God will have mercy on us. Just a side note here. Some have wondered about this response in Nineveh. What in the world just happened? Like, like here Jonah, who didn't even want to be there, walks in. It says he shouted this message, and people respond. What's going on here? Well, history gives us a clue. Assyria, that's the nation of which Nineveh was a part of, had dominated the world stage and would return to dominate the world stage, conquering Israel. In Jonah's day, they'd actually suffered some significant setbacks, and there had been some terrible famines, and followed by a sign that they considered uh, important of a total solar eclipse. And scholars tell us that in back in those days, uh, these events signified divine wrath. That is to say, I feel like we can say that God was preparing the people of Nineveh for Jonah's message. I find that interesting. Um, I have talked to enthusiastic short-term missionaries sometime, and we're going to take God's message to XYZ place. I'm like, um, I think God's already there, uh, but I appreciate your passion and uh, enthusiasm. But God is at work in places. God is at work in people's hearts. He's already there, and our message is a part of that work. A second way that we see God's grace in Jonah's message is in God's response. The Bible says this, skip down to verse 10. When God saw what they had done and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind, did not carry out the destruction he had threatened. And, and, and later on, if we skip down to chapter 4, he gives uh, a further explanation. He says this, How could I not have mercy on this city of 120,000? In case you haven't caught it by now, we serve a wonderfully gracious and merciful God. Isn't grace both amazing and baffling at the same time when you think about it? Ruth and I were staying at some friends, uh, some ministry partners in southern Spain, and it was a place where uh, there were olive groves as far as you could see. You stepped out of, a, out of town and you could just look around in any direction, olive groves everywhere. And it was harvest time, and so things were really booming along there. Things were going, and in the, in the morning, we went into the center of town, and I saw all these guys standing around with their cup of coffee. They were just... just kind of hanging out in the town square. So I asked my friend, Jose Antonio, I said, what's, what's the deal here? He said, well, they're all waiting for work. 
And so what would happen is the foremen from the olive groves would come in their trucks and they knew kind of how the harvest was going and say, I need five guys. Okay, I'll, uh, you and you and you, you know, and they would pick their five guys and off they would go. Foremen from the other farm would come in. Well, I need 10 guys. So, you know, they would pick their 10 guys and off they would go. And it, and it, and it made me think of that parable. Are you thinking of that one that Christ tells about how the, the vineyard uh, owner comes and he, and he starts his guys in the morning and he picks them and then they go and start working. And then he comes at 10 o'clock, man, we need more workers. And he picks them, and then at noon, remember? And then even at the last hour of the day, man, we got to press it. We got we to get this work done. Why are you guys still here? Come on, let's go. And, he, and then at the end of the day, what does he do? An HR nightmare. <laughs> he pays them all the same wage. Doesn't that make you mad? Like, what's going on? Can you imagine the legal trouble he would be in? And and yet he says, well, no, I fairly paid you. I promised you guys that worked all day. I told you I'd give you a day's wage, and I did that, right? And and But it's up to me what I want to do with my money. If I want to be gracious and kind, I can pay these people whatever I want. And honestly, when you read that, we don't like to argue with the Bible, especially not on Sunday morning, right? But 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 that doesn't sit well with us. Man, that doesn't seem fair. That doesn't work out math-wise. Jesus' story, the gracious owner responds to his audience and to us, says, should you be angry because I'm kind? Back in our story, Jonah was angry. He, he was flat out angry. This change of plans, chapter 4, verse 1, this change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became very angry. We, I like how this story is because there's no varnish on this. There's no gloss. It just flat out tells you. Um, and Jonah doesn't, doesn't back down. I knew this would happen. I knew you would do this because you were a gracious and compassionate God. Verse 3, filled with unfailing love, angry at God for being gracious to others even listening to himself how ridiculous that sounds we'd never be like that would we you don't have to answer that well here's a third way we see god's grace demonstrated through his response to the prophet rather than punishing jonah or casting him aside god patiently works with him showing him grace in a very personal way we see this final lesson graphically illustrated as God sends the leafy plant, chapter 4, to give the prophet shade. Uh, and he's overheated in more ways than one. And then God removes the plant and Jonah throws another tantrum and God brings the lesson home. God brings the lesson home. He says this, uh, starting at verse 9 of chapter 4, Is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonas. <laughs> he's, he's not backing down on this one. I'm angry enough to die. Verse 10, the Lord said, You feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and it died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? Ah, oh, God's grace is amazing. We sing about it, we hear sermons, we talk about it, do we live it? Listen to what author Tim Keller says in his book, The Prodigal Prophet. Ignorance of the depth of God's grace causes our most severe problems. Catch that. Ignorance of the depth of God's grace causes our most severe problems. Until we understand it, we are, like Jonah, just a shadow of what we could and should be. The doctrine of God's grace is that which sets Christianity apart from all other faiths. It is, underline this phrase, catch this, it is the central message, the gospel. And then he quotes Colossians 1, The gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it, and truly understood God's grace. All of this leads to the third and final truth from Jonah's story. One last truth. Our lives, whoops, did I do that? I'm sorry. Our lives are a living demonstration of our message. Our lives are a living demonstration. We can go to that last slide. There we go. A living demonstration of, of our message. 
It's not just understanding, oh, excuse me, it is an understanding of God's grace that makes a person a Christian and not just a moral person. There are plenty of nice people. I've got nice neighbors. You do too. They're nice people. They're trying hard. They want the best for their kids. They're working hard at their job. They're trying to do good, but who are so, so far from God. It says we understand grace that we're able to take hard stands when the world is calling us in another direction. Grace is free, but it's not cheap. It's not cheap. It costs God the sacrifice of his son to save us from judgment. And as we live that truth, we make different choices from those around us. Keller says this, unless we see what it cost him to save us, we won't be glad to obey and serve him regardless of the cost. Jonah also demonstrates that to us negatively, that understanding God's grace guards us from the trap of national or ethnic pride. Listen carefully here. We need to catch this. There's a sense that, you know, it's good to be proud. I want to I want, I want walk carefully here, but I want to say this. There's a sense that it's good to be proud of a country or of our heritage, our unique achievements and our contributions to the world. Jonah had that. If you recall, he was the one who prophesied Israel's military success in 2 Kings 14. But he also shows us how easy it is to go too far down that road of pride. He was one of God's chosen people, while these evil Assyrians were not. They were the enemy. Yes, God, pour your wrath out on them. Show grace to outsiders? No, 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 no. Didn't Israel repeatedly struggle with that? Even in the days of the early church, how could the gospel be for Gentiles and Samaritans and, and all these other people? And what do we say about us? Does my national pride, my cultural pride, hinder the message of grace that God has given me to share? Folks crossing cultures, learning another language, learning to live in another in someone else's culture, takes a lot of humility. It takes a lot of um, love to truly enter in and to pay the price necessary to serve others, to bring clarity to the message of God's grace. Finally, it's God's work in our lives that makes us a living example of His grace for all to see. How often have we prayed for more faith? or to grow in love, only to find that God seems to bring more trials in the process, temptations. How often have we longed to know God better, only to battle with feeling more distant? Later on, you can Google John Newton's hymn, the author, obviously, of uh, Amazing Grace. He has another hymn, though, and there's some great music by Laura Taylor. You can catch it on YouTube. Um, I Ask the Lord, I think is the name of the song, I asked the Lord, and this is some words from the song. It says this, why is this happening? Why have I asked for faith? I've asked to know God better, and yet I feel more distant. I've had more trials. I've had more temptations. This is in the song. This is God's response. God says, these inward trials I employ from self and pride to set thee free and break thy schemes of earthly joy that thou mayst find thy all in me. Friends, that's the story we have to tell to the nations. A story of a gracious God, a gracious God, loving God who longs to set us free so that we may delight in him and to set people free throughout the world. Will we be the ones to live and carry out that message to the nations? Let's close in prayer. Father, may your word so penetrate our hearts and lives that we are changed as a result. Lord, we long to be those who are living examples of your grace. May that be so. Father, would you show us in our hearts where we need to change, where we need to grow, where your word needs to bring about transformation. And Lord, may you use us. 
May you use Chinese Bible Church to be a light to the nations. Lord, yesterday as we prayed for the unreached people throughout the world, <clears throat> and someone's comment was, wow, there's a lot of work left to be done. Lord, could you use us, each person in this room, in your perfect way to take that message to the nations? May that be so, Lord, we pray. We're so thankful for your love and your mercy and your grace in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.